Hello, and welcome to another episode of Change of Raiment. We have much to cover, so I'm going to forego the greetings and the pleasantries and get right into our topic. All right, so before we do that, we are going to bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another opportunity to gather in your presence to study your words. And we ask, Father, that as we look at the scriptures, that you will open our eyes and make them plain to us. And may we be obedient as we learn these truths from your word. I ask that as I will disseminate this information, that it will come across clearly and that it will be conveyed in a manner that individuals can clearly understand. We thank you for hearing and for answering this humble prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as you can see from the title, tonight we are going to be dealing with head coverings. So we are going to be talking about the two coverings. And of course, we're going to be examining 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. We are going to be talking about tradition or commandment and also the two coverings. So hopefully you all have come prepared with your Bibles, of course, your notebooks and also your pens. All right. Now, I just opened up this study with a word of prayer. And there are some individuals that will say I am in violation of scriptures. Some individuals will also say that I'm in violation of scripture by even sharing this series, Change of Raiment, with you. Why would they make that assertion that I'm in violation of scripture? Well, they will say that Sister Hillary is praying with her head uncovered. She's going against scripture or she's sharing the word of God with her head uncovered, which also violates principles from 1 Corinthians 11, right? So we are going to be looking at this topic of head covering. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to dissect certain verses. Now, of course, we're not going to read through the whole thing. So that's your homework assignment to read and study this chapter uh, for yourself. But we are going to look at key scriptures and we're going to find out, am I praying with my head uncovered? Am I in violation of scripture or is my head covered? So that's what we're going to be looking at. Again, we're going to be talking about two coverings, tradition or commandment. And of course, we are going to examine 1 Corinthians chapter 11. All right. So we find this topic of head covering in, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So I want to go to the screen here and we are going to highlight key scriptures that mention covering the head. All right. And we're going to see in these first couple of scriptures, we're going to see two different coverings. All right. So let's look at this first. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 5 and 6, which read, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. That means shaven. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Let's look at this next scripture in the same 1 Corinthians 11, but let's look at verse 13. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? All right, so we see here the concept of covering one's head, specifically for two specific things, right? Praying and also prophesying. All right, let's look at this next scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15, we're going to see the second covering, which is actually the first covering because this is the original covering that God has given. But it says, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Look at the blue part. For her hair is given her for a covering. Now, we're not going to, we're going to let each word in this scripture have its proper bearing upon the text. So it says, for her hair is given her for a covering. So this is something that was given to the woman right? Who gave this woman this covering of her hair? Was it her parents? Was it her husband? Was it a friend? Was it herself? Did she give herself this covering? Who gave her this covering, which is her hair? God gave her this covering. So this is something that God gave to the woman. And what did he give it to her for? It says for a covering. So our hair is for what purpose? It's for a covering. A covering of what? Obviously, a covering of our head, right? So, is my head covered right now? 
Yes, I'm covered with the covering that God has given me, which is my hair, right? So let's go to this next slide here. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 16, those are the texts that we are going to be examining in detail. The word head is actually mentioned nine times. The word hair is mentioned three times. Now, I want to go back to the first scriptures that we shared. Look at the yellow part. Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with what uncovered? Does it say her hair uncovered or does it say her head uncovered? It says her head. Now, surely, if Paul wanted to use hair, he used it elsewhere in the scriptures, right? Three other times in those scriptures from verse 1 to 16. He could have said hair right here, but he said every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncover, uncovered dishonoreth her head. But what did God give to woman as a covering for her head? Her hair, right? That's a natural covering that God has given. All right. So we're going to find out here that there are two coverings, as I said. OK, so now let's before we go into that, I want us to look at the different um, beliefs that are out there. Now, there are probably many more than the four that I have on the screen here. However, these are some of the most uh, popular ones that I've come across. And let me just say this before I go to these um, different beliefs and theories. This is something, a topic that I've been studying for quite some time. Now, am I saying that I've arrived at the totality of the truth? No, we can never, <laughs> you know, we can never come into full understanding of every concept, right? But I've been studying this uh, for quite some time as since the time I've been sharing um, with pastor pa um, prophetic insights and even the great controversy study, the marriage reconcili st reconciliation study, this topic has come up over and over again with people inquiring, Sister Hillary, why don't you cover your head? Sister Hillary, you're breaking scripture. And so this is something I, and that I took to the Lord in prayer and I committed myself to study this concept very, very deeply. And so I'm just sharing with you from the Bible what God has been showing me and sharing with me. All right, so let's go back to the screen and let's look at these beliefs. These are some of the most common beliefs regarding head covering that I've come across, okay? And this belief is not only in Seventh-day Adventism, it's in Christendom and in other religions as well, okay? Most notably Muslims, right? But anyway, the first one would be that all women should cover their hair or head publicly at all times. Have you all heard that one? All right, what about the next one? That married women, only married women, should cover their head, hair publicly at all times. And this would be to show respect or submission to her husband. The next theory out there is that women should cover their hair in public worship settings. I'm sure we've all heard this, right? And then lastly, that women, they don't necessarily have to cover their hair all the time when they're in public. However, they should cover their hair or head while praying or prophesying, whether they are in public or in private. Have you all heard of these? Have you been confronted with this? Have you been studying this, right? So we are going to be looking at this. And again, as we showed, there are two coverings. So we're going to go back to the screen, all right? Let's look at these two coverings. So the Bible, again, I've said this over and over throughout this study on dress reform, change of raiment, that we have to be more than surface readers, right? We have to really study the word of God, right? We have to compare line upon line, line upon line, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. And oftentimes in our study, we, often, we also have to go to the concordance, right? And also our Bible dictionaries as well. So let's go back to the screen and let's look at what these coverings actually are. Because we want to be true to scripture. We want to find out what these coverings are. How many coverings did we say there are in 1 Corinthians 11 verses 1 through 16? We said there's two. Let's find out what those two are. So we have the scriptures up. We read them already, so I won't, will not read them again, right? But the word covered in verses 5 and 6 and also, well, yeah, verses 5 and 6. If you look down, the Greek word is there and also the number that you can find in the concordance. It says to cover holy, to veil, to cover, to hide. So that is a veil covering, okay? An artificial covering. Now, what I mean by an artificial covering is a covering that is not natural to you. It's something 
additional that you put on. So any veil, any cloth or other type of cloth covering, whether it be a hat, a scarf, or what have you, it's a veil, okay? So of course the word uncovered in those same scriptures, verses five, six, and also verse 13, means unveiled, right? So to veil, a veil, and when it's uncovered, you're unveiled. The word covering is actually a different Greek word for the word covered in verses 5, 6, and 13. And that means something thrown around one, i.e. a mantle. In verse 15, that says a woman's hair is her covering, so it's as if it's a mantle, right, around her head, a veil covering a vesture. So it's two different words. So we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we see two coverings. We see an Artificial, again, I'm using that word, meaning something that you're adding on, an, a cloth covering a veil. Whereas we see another covering, which is a natural covering, which is the covering of the hair. Does the hair cover the head? Yes, it does. Okay, we're going to return to these points, but we are now going to go to the beginning, right? Because we said we're going to be covering verses 1 all the way through 16. And we jumped right into 5, 6 then 13, then 15, but we haven't even looked at verses 1 and 2. So let's go to verse 1 and 2 in 1 Corinthians. And again, I hope you all have your Bible. We don't have all of the scriptures on the screen. So Paul says here, Be ye followers of me, even as I am of also, sorry, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Look at verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances. I want you all to circle the word ordinances. Keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Now, before I say that, I love words. I love the English language. I love all languages, but English is the language that I speak. And so I love to write. In writing, whether you're writing a composition, an article, an essay, a treatise, a dissertation, whatever piece of writing, you're composing, right? You always start with a thesis statement, right? A thesis statement is a short statement that basically summarizes the main point or the claim that you're making in said paper, whatever that paper or article or treatise may be, right? And so Paul starts out saying that this is an ordinance. So everything that follows now, he's going to share with us what this ordinance is. And he says, to keep the ordinances as I have delivered them unto you. So with that, keep that in mind. And also, let me just say this, a thesis statement is not only mentioned in the introduction of a paper, but where else is it reiterated? Where else is it mentioned? In the conclusion, right? When you conclude, you want to restate your thesis. You want so that the, the uh, reader leaves with that main point on their mind. We're going to see that this concept of ordinance is repeated in verse 16, right? Maybe using a different word, but it is repeated nevertheless. So now let's look deeply, let's dissect this word ordinances because this makes a big difference. Okay, so with that, let's go back to the screen. And I hope you all are following, all right? So context, all right, yes, let's look at this. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things. We just read that and keep the ordinances. If you have a Bible that has a marginal reference, you should see a little number by that word ordinance. And if you look in your marginal reference, I'm not gonna tell you what it says. You put in the chat, what does it say in the marginal reference? And I'm gonna go to the concordance, right? So I looked this word up in the concordance as well, this word ordinance. And according to the concordance, the Greek word again is paradosis and the number is given. It is a Jewish traditionary law. It is a tradition. Now on that same point, if you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 15, note that verse, it says here, this is Paul. Paul wrote Thessalonians, right? And it says here, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions. So again, he's telling them, remember the traditions. Now let me ask you this question. Is a tradition a commandment? Right now, granted, we all know there are many traditions in the world, and these are things that people have followed and that kind of pass on, you know, from generation to generation. Right. Some traditions are good. Some traditions may be based on the Bible and are based on the Bible. Is a tradition a command? Right. 
or is it just simply that a tradition? Also, there are bad traditions, right? So you all participate in the chat or in the comments. You guys give me some example of good traditions that have been followed, and you can also give me some bad traditions. Now, obviously, if Paul is admonishing the believers in Corinth to follow this ordinance or this Jewish traditionary law, obviously this is a good tradition, right? Now, again, on the screen, we're asking the question, is it a tradition or custom, or is it a command from God? We see the different definitions here of each. So a tradition is the transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation, or the fact of being passed on in this way. A commandment is a divine order from God. This is something that must be done, right? It comes from God, not man, all right? So now, was this tradition based on a commandment from God? I submit to you, if it were based on a commandment from God, we should be able to find this commandment from God elsewhere in the scripture, right? So we are supposed to be diligent students of the word and we are supposed to go from Genesis all the way back to the beginning because that's where it began, right? And we should be able to find, if it is based on a commandment, if it is a command that a woman should put an artificial veil or a cloth covering over her head, we should be able to find it in the very beginning. And we should also not only be able to find where it was first instituted, but we should be able to find it carried out throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, right? Do we find such a command? Well, let's go to the beginning. Let's talk about the beginning, all right? Because Isaiah 46 says that remembering the former things that God tells what? The end from the beginning. So let's go back to the beginning. Now, just about every one of our episodes of Change of Raiment, we always end up in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, right? We always talk about them when they sinned and they lost that glorious covering of light that God gave them and how they tried to make up for that and put on the, uh, put on the fig leaves to cover their nakedness, yet they were still left naked and exposed. It was inadequate. And what did God have to clothe them with? What was the change of raiment that God gave to Adam and Eve? He gave to them what? Coats of skin. Both of them got coats of skin. Let me ask you this question. Were it obligatory for the woman to cover her head, would we not have found it there? Would God not have provided Eve with a veil of skin to accompany her coat of skin? We should be able to find it there, right? If it were an issue of modesty, because I've also heard the belief that if a woman does not have her head covered publicly, that it is immodest, that it somehow reveals nakedness. Was Adam and Eve's nakedness covered in the Garden of Eden when he gave them that uh, robe of the coats of skin? They were covered. They were not naked, neither Adam nor Eve. Was Eve's head covered? Yes, it was. What was it covered with? Was it covered with, again, a veil of skin or a scarf of skin or some type of external addition to her hair? Or did God provide for her the covering, which was her hair? She was covered. She was not declared immodest. All right. So now I hope that point makes sense. So we don't see it being instituted there. Let's move on to the sanctuary service, because the Bible says thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, right? So everything that we believe as Seventh-day Adventists, matter of fact, the sanctuary service is what makes us who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. So we should be able to find this if it is a command. Remember, we're asking the question, is it a tradition or is it a commandment? If it's a command, we should be able to find it. Do we find anywhere in the sanctuary service where God is commanding or telling women, when you present your offerings to the Lord, and there's many offerings, the thank offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the list goes on and on, that you are to come to the sanctuary with a veil on? Do we find that? Right? We can look through the whole of the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible, right? Are there instructions given on dress reform in the first five books of the Bible? Yes. There's plenty of instruction given on how we should dress how there should be a distinction of dress between man and woman. That's in the first five books of the Bible. 
right? We see that we're to have a distinction in dress by having the garment of blue. There are so, we see how the priests are supposed to be attired. We see many, many principles of dress reform in the Torah, in those first five books. Do we see the commandment where women must have their heads covered publicly, must have their heads covered when they go into the sanctuary with an additional scarf, veil, or some type of covering other than that of her hair? Do we find that? We don't find it in the sanctuary. Okay, we can move forward. Look at the rest of the books of the Old Testament. Do we find this command anywhere being instituted? We haven't seen where it's been instituted. Neither have we seen it anywhere else in scripture. So we would ask the question, where is the second and third witness for um, these beliefs that people have that women have to have their head covering with an additional artificial covering on top of the covering God gave them. So think about it, when we put on the veil, and there's nothing wrong with covering your hair, absolutely not. You can wrap your head and you can wear a scarf, you can wear a hat. We're not saying it's wrong or you're rejecting God's covering, but God has given us our hair for our covering. So when we put on another covering, it's like we're saying, we need a covering for our covering. Does that make sense? Is that what we're saying, that we have to have a covering for our covering? All right, so we can't find it elsewhere in the Old Testament. We go to the Gospels. Do we find it in the Gospels? No, we don't find it in the Gospels. We do find an instance where Mary Magdalene is at the feet of Jesus, and she's, what is she doing at the feet of Jesus? She's expressing her gratitude. She's pouring out her heart. Is she praying? She's weeping, right? She's crying. She's probably um, confessing her sins. And what is she doing to his feet with her hair? She's drying his feet with her hair. Did Christ rebuke her there? Did he? All right, so we go to the rest of Paul's writings. Other than this scripture where he says, remember the ordinances, right? Do we find anywhere else besides 1 Corinthians 11 a command for women to cover their hair? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that and look in Paul's writings a little deeper. Now, I'm going to put a, uh, a bookmarker right there. We're going to come back to this point, but we're going to now deal with the context, right, of 1 Corinthians 11. So what is Paul talking about here in this chapter? If you read all 16 verses from 1 to 16, we will see clearly what Paul is talking about. Is he merely just mentioning the head covering? Because many times we like to pull a scripture here and pull a scripture there, and we take it out of its original context and make it say something that it may not necessarily be saying. And hence, you have people, even in the Sunday churches, that do that, and they pull out one scripture, especially with the writings of Paul. You know, even Peter says that Paul's writings sometimes can be difficult to understand. But they'll pull out a scripture and they'll say that based on this scripture, you know, the Bible is supporting slavery. So we're going to put you, you know, make you a slave. And they do things like that. So we cannot just pull a scripture here and a scripture here and then build a teaching or a belief out of that scripture. So remember, context is always king. So what is the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 16? Let's go to the screen. So we'll find that the context of 1 Corinthians 11 is God's biblical order. Okay? You can find that repeated throughout multiple times. The key verses that you'll find that mention, 3, 8, 9, and 12. Now, what is God's biblical order? We should all know this. Of course, Christ is the head. Christ is the head of the man. And then, of course, we find man being the head of the woman, right? That's God's order. Christ, man, the woman. When was this order established? This order was established in the Garden of Eden after the fall because Eve, she tempted the husband. And when God was telling them what the result of their sins would be, that's when God established that order. He said, your heart should be towards your husband, he shall rule over thee, right? So you see God's biblical order. That's what 1 Corinthians, and if you just glance at those verses that we just had up on the screen, you will see clearly that that's what the context of 1 Corinthians uh, 11 is, verses 1 to 16. So now, that is what, what the head covering, the cloth, additional head covering, the veil, 
was based on. It was based on God's biblical order. It was a symbol to show a woman's submissiveness to her husband, right? Not to any man, but to her husband. So now, if it were a command of God, again, I'm going back to Adam and Eve, would it not have been instituted when God established that order after Adam and Eve fell? When God said, okay, Eve, you're going to experience pain in childbirth. Your desire should be towards your husband. He shall rule over thee. You must wear a head, uh, a head covering, you know, to show your submissiveness to your husband. Would he not have put it right there? It's not there. Okay? So again, we have to understand the context. So what I did, again, we have to be diligent students of Bibles. I said, let me look at all of the other instances in scripture where God is talking about this biblical order, Christ being the head, man next, and then woman being submissive to her husband. And most of these are written by Paul, the same Paul that wrote 1 Corinthians. So I went to all of these various scriptures, right? We just talked about Genesis chapter 3, so I'm not going to talk about that again. Ephesians 5, 22 and verse 33 that talks about God's biblical order. I looked for the head covering. Was it there to show that a woman is submissive or subservient to her husband? I didn't find it there, right? Colossians 3.18, which says, Wives, submit your, to your husbands as fit in the Lord. I looked for, for the head covering there. I did not see it there. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 to 15. It also talks about God's biblical order. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. In none of these scriptures do we find the head covering being mentioned. We don't see it being introduced again. Also, Titus 2, 5, where it says older women should be an example to younger women of how they should be submissive to their husbands. It wasn't there in Titus either. Now, let me just mention something about 1 Timothy 2 and also 1 Peter 3. Do you remember our last session where we dealt with the hair? We looked in detail in those scriptures. 1 Timothy 2, we looked at 9 and 10. And also we looked at 1 Peter chapter 3, I believe, 3 and 4. And the head covering wasn't mentioned, but guess what was mentioned in those scriptures? Modesty of dress and also modesty in how we did our hair, right? It talked about not with broided hair in 1 Timothy. And then in 1 Peter, not with the plaiting of hair. And we explained what that meant, the add-ons, the additional, the extravagance, right? We talked about that. So now were it a command from God that a woman's head must be covered at all times or even in church settings, public settings, wouldn't, why would we need the instruction on how we are to do our hair? Why would we need that instruction? Because our hair would already be covered, right? It just makes sense. Now, Proverbs 31, I added that there. It doesn't necessarily deal with the order of the home, but what does Proverbs 31 deal with? And all ladies should really know this because this is what we are aspiring to be, a virtuous woman of God, right? So I looked at the virtuous woman. The virtuous woman is a woman that is uh, su uh, submissive to her husband. You know, she takes care of her children, right? She does missionary work. She helps the less fortunate. It mentions all the things she works willingly with her hands. It mentions all the things that a virtuous woman is and that a virtuous woman does. Does it say that she has her head covered? Because many people, like I said before, I'm just repeating, many people say that it, it is immodest for a woman to reveal her hair, which is the covering God has given her. It's immodest or somehow um, not humble to show your hair. But does it mention anything about the virtuous woman that in order to be a virtuous woman, we must cover our head, heads with an artificial covering? No. Why? Because God has given her her hair for a covering, a covering of what? A covering of her head. So when I opened up this session and I prayed, was I praying uncovered or covered? You answer the question. Two coverings, the covering that God gave, the natural covering of the hair or the artificial. Again, there's nothing wrong if you want to wear a wrap around your head. There's nothing wrong if you put on a hat as a woman or a scarf or a veil. Just make sure whatever you put on your head follows the principles of simplicity. Same thing with your hair, right? You're not supposed to have extravagant hair, right? Or add on these 
things that would draw attention. We dealt with that last time. I'm not going back there. We have other principles to cover, okay? So now we're gonna go back to the screen and let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So what is the conclusion here? Look at verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Paul oversaw many churches, not just the church in Corinth that he's writing this to. But he says, if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such, what's that word again? Custom. Do you remember when we said that we have to, that the, we talked about the thesis statement rather, that any type of piece of writing, it starts out with a thesis, which is your main theme that you're talking about in your paper or whatever you're writing. It's reiterated here. So the same way Paul starts, remember the ordinances that I have delivered unto you. Remember these Jewish traditionary laws. Why? Because it was teaching a lesson. It was showing God's biblical order, right? It was, an it was to be an example of God's biblical order and a woman's submissiveness to her husband and a husband's submissiveness to Christ, right? So he ends the same way. So we are not to make this matter of covering one's head with a veil or a scarf a matter of contention. It is not a test. It is not salvational. Someone that prays or goes to church in a public worship setting who decides to wear God's covering, which is her hair, God, that God gave her, the covering of her head, she is not in violation of scripture. If you decide to cover your head in public worship, you're not in violation of scripture either. So long as your hair on one hand follows the principles of modesty, simplicity, etc. So long as whatever head covering you have follows the model uh, or the principles of hair reform, right? Or dress reform, you're not in violation of scripture. So it's not to be a matter of contention. It is not a test question. It is a custom. Let's look at the definition of custom. It's the same as tradition, right? It's a synonym for tradition, a traditional and widely accepted way of behaving or doing something that is specific to a particular society, place, or time. All right, so now that we've laid that strong biblical foundation from the Bible, we are going to now look at the spirit of prophecy. We're going to see if the spirit of prophecy tells us that we are to be covering our heads as women, whether at all times, because we looked at four different beliefs, all times publicly, or if we are to cover our heads when we are in prayer, to cover our heads um, when we are prophesying. And by prophesying, I'm using that term very loosely to say when we are sharing, like doing what I'm doing now, when we are um, sharing the word of God, okay? So a lot of people misuse a particular quote from Ellen White, and excuse me for reading the whole thing, but it is very important, okay? We're studying, right? And this is the statement that they misuse to say that a woman's hair or hair, head must be covered publicly at all times. And it says here, I was shown that some of the people of God imitate the fashions of the world and are fast losing their peculiar holy character, which should distinguish them as God's people. How? I was pointed back to God's ancient people and then was led to compare their apparel with the mode of dress in these last days. What a difference. What a change. Then the women were not so bold as now. Why? How, Ellen White? When they went in public, what did they do? What did they cover? They covered their face with a veil. In these last days, fashions are so shameful and immodest. They are noted in prophecy. They were first brought in by a class over whom Satan has entire control who, being past feeling without any conviction of the Spirit of God, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. If God's professed people had not departed greatly from him, there would now be a marked difference between their dress and that of the world. The small bonnets exposing what two things? The face and the head show a lack of modesty. We don't need to read the rest of that because the rest deals with the hoops and other things. All right, so what does it say? The small bonnets exposing the face and the head show a lack of modesty. So people now will say, whew, there it is, we found it. Ellen White is saying when we go out in public, our heads must be covered based on that statement right there. All right, well, if we're going to say that based on that statement, our heads must be covered, 
we also must cover our faces as well. Isn't that right? Isn't that what the quotation said? That the bonnets exposing the face and the head? So basically, the only thing that would need to be showing would be your eyes. Reread those yellow parts. Let's be consistent. Let's not just pick and choose. So if Ellen White is saying that you must cover your head publicly at all, at all times, you better find a type of veil that covers your face too. And I've never heard any of the proponents of uh, covering your heads say that our faces must be covered. So you cannot use this statement here. Sorry, you can't use it. And as a matter of fact, speaking of custom, Ellen White speaks of a worldly custom where people are covering their faces. Let's see what she says here. And this is Testimonies from the, for the Church, Volume 6, page 146. Many today have veils upon their faces. These veils are in sympathy, it should be in sympathy with the customs and practices of the world, which hide from them the glory of the Lord. God desires us to keep our eyes fixed upon him that we may lose sight of the things of this world. Okay, so we see a worldly custom where the faces are covered, right? So that first quotation that we just read, the one previous, she's just drawing a contrast between people following the worldly fashions of the world, right? As opposed to following the simple fashions that God, not fashions, the simple dress that God has given to his people, right? That was the point that was being made here, okay? Now, let me say this. For those of you that say, okay, well, we're not saying that a woman has to wear, cover her head at all times, but just when she is praying. So whether she's at home or whether she's at church or wherever she is. What about the scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5? I believe it's 17 that says we are to pray without ceasing, right? And we as Christians, we understand, especially Seventh-day Adventists, that prayer is the breath of the soul. So as we breathe, as natural as it is for us to breathe, we should be praying. We should always be cognizant of the presence of God beside us at all times. So when I'm doing dishes, guess what? I'm talking to God. When I'm driving, I'm talking to God. When I'm riding in the passenger seat, I'm talking to God. When I'm on the phone, listening, I'm praying, Lord, help me to be able to um, share. Let my words be seasoned with grace, right? I'm praying, Lord, let me know how to respond to this person, to minister to this soul, right? While I'm homeschooling, I'm praying, Lord, help me to be able to teach my children in a way that they can understand. So there's never a time throughout the day when I'm not talking to God. Even when I'm exercising, I'm talking to God. Lord, I'm tired, you, right? Give me strength to finish out, finish this exercise program. I'm always talking to God. We are always to be talking to God, right? There's never a time. Again, prayer is the breath of the soul. So you do, do you mean to tell me if that were the case, then we would have to have our heads covered at all time because we are to always be in the attitude of prayer, right? And Paul also, the same Paul in Romans 12, 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. That means praying always. When you're showering, when you're, whatever you're doing, you're always praying and talking to God. So let's get back to Ellen White here. Let's look at some other counsels that were given. Now, again, dealing with the sanctuary, we're not going to read all of this. This is for you to read. I want you to go to the second section in yellow, right? The hair should be carefully arranged. Does it only say men's hair should be carefully arranged? No, the hair should be careful. This is counsel for all of us. So if, again, if our heads as women, hair were to be covered with a scarf or a veil at all time, would this counsel be necessary? It wouldn't be necessary because guess what? Our hair would be covered. Now, what does Ellen White say? She had a experience where she is ministering. She's actually addressing a congregation. And this is very important. I've had a prosperous journey, she says. I have attended many meetings in different places. At Indianapolis, I was surprised to meet so large a number on the Sabbath. So is she in a Sabbath church? She's in a Seventh-day Adventist church. She's in a congregation. I met with the most intelligent looking people in the church. The audience presented a singular appearance for all the sisters had done what? Had removed their hats. This was well. It was what? It was an abomination? No, she says this was well. Why was it well? 
I was impressed with the favorable appearance. The people were not obliged to stretch their necks to see over a mass of flowers and ribbons. What does she say in this yellow portion? I believe that this is an example worth following by other congregations. Now, surely you can't. Now, Ellen White gives many counsels about keeping the head cool. We learned that in our lesson on hair, right? So surely the women didn't have a, a scarf or a veil under the hat because obvious that, that would really make the head hot, would it not? So the women removed their hats and she said this was well. And what does she say other congregations should do? They should follow, other congregations should follow this example. So certainly if there was a rebuke or if there was a violation of scripture in having these women not having their head covers with, covered with an artificial covering, this counsel would not be given. So do we believe in the spirit of prophecy or do we not? Do we believe in the Bible or do we not? Do we believe that God has given to women their hair for a covering or do we not? I accept the covering that God has given me. I accept my hair as a covering over my head. It's natural. God has given me that. Okay, so Ellen White had another experience. So let's read about this second experience on the screen here. So now she is in Los Angeles. All right, anyone in the chat from Los Angeles or from California? It says, a week ago, I spoke in the church in Los Angeles and the house was crowded to its utmost capacity. I wish a picture could have been drawn of the crowd. That crowded congregation was the most agreeable sight I have ever looked upon and everything was in order. Every receptacle for flowers was removed. Every seat that could be crowded in was occupied. There was not one crying voice of a child and the pleasant, happy faces were a sight that brought joy to my heart and did my soul good. The sisters, as far as I could see, did what? Remove their hats and what a pleasure it was to view their countenances. I had good freedom in speaking. Is any commentary necessary there or is the point made? So we dealt with the point about we've debunked the fact that we're not supposed to that the Bible is not commanding us to cover our heads as women while we're in public. Now we're dealing with the point while we're in church. Now, while you're in a church setting, are there times for prayer? Absolutely. So you mean to tell me every time a prayer was said, the hats came back on. And then while Sister White was addressing the congregation, they took them off and kept putting them on and taking them off. I don't know about you, but while I'm sitting and listening to the message, I'm praying all the way through the message. I'm praying for the speaker that the speaker may communicate the word of God. I'm praying for my, my own heart. Lord, examine me, search me, right? I'm praying for the other congrega congregants. Lord, help this message to hit all of us. So I'm praying all throughout the church service, not just at the specified times when we, before the message or after the message or what have you, we're praying all throughout the service. So again, do we ha is it obligatory? Is it a command of God that we cover our heads with a hat while we are in the sanctuary, a scarf, a veil, what have you, a wrap? Okay, let's look at this. You know what I found very interesting? That as I studied, I wasn't able to find any, as we went through in our previous uh, session at the beginning, I wasn't able to find from Genesis to Revelation the command where God is telling women that you must have your head covered. We don't see it instituted anywhere, right? But we do find some rebukes that are given based on a woman's dress and based on some of the head coverings that they wear that are in harmony with the world and even in paganism. So let's look at this quotation and then we're going to look at Isaiah 3. Very important, right? So it says here, the prophecy of Isaiah 3, and you can note the specific verses at the heading of this. It says here, the prophecy of Isaiah 3 was presented before me as applying for these last days. And the reproofs are given to the daughters of Zion who have thought only of appearance and display. Read verse 25. Thy men should fall by the sword and thy mighty in war. I was shown that this scripture will be strictly fulfilled. So go to Isaiah 3. And I want to show you something that Isaiah 3 mentions a lot of adornment that women are using, but the head coverings are mentioned more than any other article is mentioned in Isaiah 3. Now, of course, the jewelry is mentioned. That's mentioned. And this is something that God's people should not put on themselves. 
but the head coverings, look how many times the head coverings are mentioned. And I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to read some of it, right? And it says, and it says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. Okay, let's go to 17. It says that the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head. Why? He's going to take away what? Their tinkling ornaments. That's the jewelry about their feet. Their calls. That's a head covering. Their round tires, like the moon. That's a head covering. The chains, that's jewelry again, and we are going to do a, another presentation on jewelry. The bracelets, the mufflers, another head covering. The bonnets, another head covering. The ornaments of the legs. So again, we see repeated the head coverings and also the jewelry, right? The headbands, tablets, earrings, rings, nose jewels. It goes on and on. And we're going to show you what some of these things are. Because while a lot of people say, which is true, that people can get caught up in their hair and there's a lot of vanity attached to hair and that's why people are always doing different things and trying to draw attention to this, themselves with the, um, the hair but that can be done also with the head coverings too because some people even put little jewels and little accessories even on the little wraps and head coverings that they have right or even the hats that they wear can be very extravagant with the bows and the feathers and the ribbons and all these things so while the hair is covered they are still manifesting vanity and pride based on this external head covering. So yes, there's caution on either side. It's all about the heart, right? So let's look at what some of these head coverings are. And this graphic on the screen here comes from the book, Thy Nakedness, from Gwen and Rick Shorter. I, this was a book that I recommended to you all um, in some of our earlier sessions. And please, I'm putting another plug out. If you do not have this book, please order this book. It will be life changing based solely and wholly on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So I took these graphics from there and basically these are the head coverings that were mentioned there. You can see them and you have the hoods, you have other things. These are, this is what some of them look like. The kerchiefs, even in Ezekiel 13, I want you to note that verse 18 and 21. There's also another startling rebuke and something related to these veils. Um, Right. So these are all the different head coverings that were mentioned in Isaiah three. So pause the screen, read it. If you have thy nakedness, there's a whole chapter dealing with head coverings that you can um, read up on it and also get some of the references from the spirit of prophecy. OK, so as we are winding down again, like I said, this is not a matter of contention. So if you want to wear God's natural covering in the sanctuary and pray with it, you can do so. God will hear your prayer because guess what? You are covered. Now just imagine how that, how ridiculous this sounds, that God is not going to hear my prayer because I don't have an additional um, cloth covering on my head. That, that doesn't even make sense, especially when God has given the hair for a covering. Your head is covered. And even if, a, let's, God forbid, let's say a woman is, you know, um, sick or whatever, and she somehow loses her hair and she's crying out to God, you mean to tell me God is not going to hear her prayer if she doesn't put an artificial um, wrap over her head while she's praying? That sounds a little superstitious to me. How about you? So now, again, is there anything wrong with wearing a hat? No, there's not. But if you do, make sure it's simple. No extra trimmings. All right, you can take down that reference, all right, and you can um, read that. Same thing here, specific instructions about the extravagance, how this um, has, especially in the church, you know, churches, uh, the Sunday churches, but unfortunately, it is carried over into some of the metropolitan big churches as well with these oversized extravagant um, hats. So you can, again, take down that reference. And now I want to ask you the question, would you rather have the hat of feathers or the crown of thorns? I would remind the youth who ornament their persons and wear feathers upon their hats that because of their sins, our Savior's head wore the shameful crown of thorns. So while we're putting vanity into these external artificial things and we're adding all of these things to draw attention and because of pride and vanity, are we remembering Christ our Savior? What did he wear upon his head? A crown of thorns. And it's because of that sacrifice that he made for us 
that he is providing us with a change of raiment, his righteousness, and also the garments that he wants us to wear. So on Ellen White, I'm going to close off with these graphics. Right? This is Ellen White, and I got this from the Ellen White Estates. She's addressing a general conference session in 1901. Now, is she, do we as Seventh-day Adventists consider her a prophet, prophetess? Yes, we do, right? So as she's, she's addressing a congregation, do you believe that she prayed before she addressed this group, this session? I believe she did. Does she have a, a head covering on? Does she have a hat? Does she have a scarf, a bonnet, a veil? Right? Does she? <laughs> and as Pastor and I were discussing this, he said, unless it were, they photoshopped it out, right? She, she doesn't have it on, okay? That was 1901. There's another picture here. Ellen White publicly speaking. This is 1906, a few years after, on another occasion in Loma Linda. She's addressing the, uh, another congregation here. She doesn't have anything on her head. Now, we're not saying... We know that Ellen White is not our example. God is our example. But we're just showing from the Bible and confirming with the spirit of prophecy that God has given us a covering as women, right, which is our hair. And that the ordinance, right, the practice of women covering their hair and their heads with a scarf, cloth covering, a veil, right, because we discovered that that first covering was a veil, that was a custom. It was a tradition. We're not saying it was a bad tradition. It wasn't a bad tradition. There's nothing wrong, again, with it. If it's a tradition, it's a tradition, right? But we're saying that today, that tradi we, have, we recognize that that is a tradition and that God has given us a covering. And we recognize why that tradition or that custom was put in place to show a woman's submissiveness to her husband. Now, does the mere wearing of a veil mean that a woman is going to be submissive to her husband? No. While it was to symbolize that, do you really believe that every woman that wrapped her head in a veil or a scarf, she was submissive? No. Some of them were trying to boss their husbands around and proverbially speaking, wearing the pants and trying to run things, right? So that doesn't make one, one's character, you know, a meek and quiet spirit. No. And there's another tradition that people have, which is a bad tradition, a worldly tradition. What's that tradition today that people use or custom to say that a man and a woman is married? What tradition do they have today in all countries around the world? And it's crept into Adventism. Would that not be the wedding band? Well, does that, and like we said, the Bible condemns jewelry. So that's a bad tradition, obviously. But does that wedding band mean that you're going to be face, faithful to your husband or to your wife? No, I'm sure the majority of people that are, are committing adultery or have ever committed adultery, they did so with a wedding band, or maybe they slipped it off at the time to tell their little lies and whatever. All right, I'm rambling now, but I, I really hope you all got the point of this study, and I hope that the questions that some of you had were clarified, and I hope that this was meet and due, due season. So all I can do is encourage you to keep studying, keep praying. The Lord will continue to reveal um, truth to you as you do so um, in an unobjective way with a sincere heart with pure motives. So as we close, let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this study once again. We thank you for the truth that you communicated to us, and we pray that these points will leave a lasting indelible impression in the hearts of the listeners and that we will be obedient to, uh, thus saith the Lord, the commands that you have given us. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.